good day everybody and welcome back to the channel. Well today we have two small portable typewriters made in Western Germany. This is a 1957 Princess Exemplar 300. You've seen the video on this recently most likely. And this is the 1961 Olympia Splendid 33. I did a video about this a while ago. I'll put links to both of those videos down below. But I'd like to do today a comparison between these two. These are mid 20th century, made in West Germany, what today we might call ultra portables or flat portables. Very small, lightweight, German-made typewriters from the mid-20th century. Let's take a look at them, shall we? Stay tuned. And I should also mention here that comparing these two typewriters is not exactly fair for the Splendid 33 because it's the least full-featured model of the Splendid lineup, whereas the Exemplar 300 had the most features of the Princess lineup. But these happen to be the two that are in my collection, so I guess I have to compare them, unless one of you guys wants to ship me, you know, Splendid 66. You know, maybe I could do another comparison, right? Okay. Well, I think I should start out by showing you the cases for both of these typewriters. You know, a lot of times I forget to mention the cases. It's kind of interesting. Well, they're small portable typewriters. The Exemplar Princess has a case that reminds me a lot of a Calibri in the sense of the brown leather and also having a little snap pouch or a little folder in the back where you can store paper and other writing accessories. And I find this style of case to be supremely useful for the on-the-go writer because you have a handle that you can carry the typewriter by, it's not that heavy, and then you have all your writing supplies right inside the case itself. So you don't really need to take any other writer's bag or any other accessory bag. Well, the case itself here has a metal rim, a metal angle bracket on the back side, and it has to fit underneath the back of the typewriter on the Exemplar 300 here in order for it to be snapped on. And of course you have to center the carriage on the Exemplar. In order to do that you have this little T-shaped nut or knob on the middle of the left platen knob and you fold down the carriage return lever into underneath that T-shaped knob and then you push the, the lever so the side of the carriage return arm is touching the left side of the body. That centers the carriage. It's not a true carriage lock, however. This typewriter screws down onto a base. So when we're looking at the size of this typewriter in a few minutes, we're going to be measuring it, but I'm going to be measuring it in terms of when you're using it with the typewriter on the base because that's mostly how most people are going to use it. You're not going to carry it to a coffee shop and pull out a screwdriver and undo the two screws. I just don't think people are going to do that. So that's how I'm going to measure it and weigh it accordingly as you would use it. On the other hand, the Olympia has a hard shell case that reminds me a lot more of the Royal Mercury. It has a similar kind of an idea of a bracket on the back here that fits underneath the rear frame of the typewriter and it snaps in front. There is a pretty hefty set of metal brackets here that are spring loaded by buttons that latch onto underneath the typewriter. So they're pretty nicely engineered, I think. So how easy is the clamshell lid to put on both of these machines. And we'll start with the Princess. I've already uh, centered the carriage, folded down the carriage return arms. So you have to get this metal rail underneath the back of the machine on the Princess. And you kind of have to feel it that it's caught. And then you have to kind of flip it up. Make sure the metal rail is underneath the bottom. And then on this particular latch for this machine, it doesn't really line up and you have to kind of pinch the closure mechanism to get it to go in the slots like that. So it's a little fiddly. You have to be kind of careful with it, right? Okay, so the Splendid 33. Boom. <laughs> yeah. I think we know the Splendid 33 wins the contest in this case. Okay, let's weigh each of these machines. See if you can see that. Nine pounds, four ounces for the Olympia Splendid 33. And 11 pounds, 3.2 ounces for 
the Princess Exemplar 300. So the Princess is about two pounds heavier. So let's find out the measurement. So width-wise, it looks like on both of these machines, the carriage knob is going to define the maximum width, probably close to 300 millimeters for the width of the Olympia. And the depth front to back is going to be 283 millimeters. Whereas with the Princess, well, if you fold it down so it's compact, it looks like about 305 millimeters, so maybe about 7 or 8 millimeters wider. And then front to back, 320 millimeters front to back on the base itself. And I think right here you can probably see easily the difference in height between both carriage return arms in their deployed usable position. The machines themselves are pretty close to being the same height. Of course, because the exemplar is sitting on this base here, it does sit a little higher. So the Olympus is a little flatter when it's sitting on a table. In terms of usability, I do like a carriage return arm on the Princess. It is much higher and easier to hit. It reminds me more of kind of a Hermes 3000, not necessarily in the shape of it, but more in the position and height of it. It's just easy to hit. We're down here, you get the sense that you're coming down really close to the surface of the ribbon cover. It feels a lot shorter. Well, it is a lot shorter. Here we go. Yes, the Olympus definitely has a shorter carriage return arm than the Princess. So Princess is a little more usable in terms of long-term riding, really easy to throw the carriage back than on the Olympus. Now here's another usability difference that I find significant between both machines. And this is also my criticism with typewriters that have the magic margin, the Royals. On this typewriter, like a lot of them that have the push and slide controls, they're often visible from the operator's position, and that's true with the Exemplar 300. You can tell where your margins are at just by looking at the machine from the operator's viewpoint. However, on the Olympus, it does have push and slide controls, but the controls are hidden in the back of the machine, but you have these little... Uh, pieces of metal indicator arms with tiny little red indicators, but they're not quite as visible from the operator's position. Here you have to be looking higher up down onto the machine to see the actual margin indicators that are right on the top of the rear paper scale. I don't know how important that is to you, but it is nice to know where your margins are at so you don't have to fiddle with them as much when you're getting your paper put in the machine. So for the carriage controls, on the left side of the exemplar, the line spacing selector is actually marked 1, dash, and 2. So it actually tells you what those line spacings are on that little tiny scale. And the platen release lever, which is your line spacing variable, is this little knurled knob right behind the line spacing selector. This particular control is the temporary line spacing variable. So when you put it back into the ratcheting position, you'll go back to the original line spacing you had. The permanent line spacing variable is on the right platen knob. And I'll also point your attention to the both left and right side of the paper bale have these nice little fingers that is convenient for you to lift up the paper bale. On the Olympus, on the left side, I've folded down the carriage return arm so you can see it better. Uh, you have three marks for your line spacing selector. Uh, the top one or the back one is one, the middle one is one and a half, and the front one is two. But they're not actually numbered. And then there is a dot position behind the number one position, and that is your single line spacing variable. And that is a temporary line spacing variable setting. So this machine only has the temporary line spacing variable, not the permanent one. The carriage locking lever is right behind the left edge of the paper bale. This enables you to truly lock the carriage. That is a positive lock. It will protect your escapement. Similar to the exemplar, both the left and right corners of the paper bale have these nice little protrusions to make it convenient for you to lift up the paper bale. And also, the paper bale scale, both machines have a numbered scale. However, the Olympia has rubber sleeve paper bale rollers, whereas the exemplar just has a flat paper bale that sits down against the paper itself. So here are your push and slide margin controls for the Splendid. 
Of course, you can't see them from the operator's position, but you can reach around and certainly touch them, and they are knurled or grooved for good texture, and they're kind of curved, so they do fit in your fingertips very nicely. And again, the indicators are these tiny little protrusions up here. They're just not real noticeable from the operator's position. I should also point out the paper support lever is folded down and it has a tiny little bend of metal right on the tip of it. You can't actually see that from the operator's position, but you have to know that you have to, it's back there and you have to kind of hook your fingernail in the back of it and if you don't have sharp fingernails you may not be able to get it, but that is the paper support arm and it is not telescoping. And then on the right side of the carriage we have the right carriage knob and we have the paper release lever right back here that releases the tension on the feed rollers and we have the single carriage release lever on the right side here and you pull it towards you to free up the carriage for movement. I do like the precision made in Western Germany badge there. It's very prominent. It was obvious that they were uh, using that for the export market to remind you that it's German made. Well, you have some very visible margin settings, easily visible from the front operator's position. The paper support finger is rested in this slot here, and to release it, you have this little cutout right here with a little silver button. And if you push that button with your finger, Boop. Again, it is a single length. It's not telescoping. You can't really hit it with your fingertip. You have to use your fingernail because the button is recessed down at the bottom of that grooved slot there. You kind of have to fit it like that and hit it with your fingernail. But it's a very novel way of releasing the paper finger. Okay, so on the right side of the carriage for the exemplar, the carriage release button is right here. And I actually find this to be better than on the Splendid because you you simply push it down instead of pulling it forward and it makes it a little more convenient if you're using, for instance, your thumb, you can just grab a hold of the knob and then push your thumb down and it works really nicely. And then the feed rollers, the paper release, you pull toward you to release the feed rollers like that. And then you have an all clear for the tabulator right here. This, you push it down and it will clear all the tabs. Well, as we look at both keyboards side by side, keep in mind that this keyboard is really designed for the American market from West Germany. This is a British keyboard, so there are some differences. For instance, notably the fractions. There's more fractions on a British keyboard than the American keyboards, and notably is the pound symbol versus the dollar sign. But other than that, the keyboards are very similar, also keeping into account this machine has full key set tabulator and bichrome setting, whereas the Splendid 33 has neither bichrome or tabulator. However, what the Splendid lineup does offer you is if you jam your type bars together, the margin release button operates as a key de-jammer, whereas with the Princess, the margin release is not a key de-jammer. So there is a little difference there. Also, because of the difference between British and American keyboards, you'll notice some of the fractions and symbols are in different places, like the percentage symbol is with the half fraction down here, whereas with an American keyboard, the percentage is a shifted five, and the half fraction is along with the quarter fraction on that key up there. This has an equal sign. The plus sign is over here. This has a number one key, and the plus equals is here, which is kind of interesting because a lot of times you'll see the plus equals on the same key with an American keyboard. This is a British keyboard. It has it. Yeah, there are some differences. Of course, this machine is 1957. This is 1961. So maybe that was the transition time or when a lot of portable typewriters are starting to add the number one key, where this one still does not have the number one key. Both of them have a backspace key on the right side, so if you're used to that, it wouldn't be hard getting used to either of these machines. And they have very similar size typeface, about 11 characters per inch, and of course they have the half line spacing feature up on the line spacing selector. As far as the size of the keyboards, I usually measure the ASDF row from the left side of the A key to the right side of whatever the last key is. And, of course, we're going to use millimeters because that makes sense. We can use either one here. It's at 205, about 204.5 millimeters keyboard width for the uh, Princess. And it is 
204 for the Olympia, so very close to the same width of key spacing. However, the shape of the keys is different. You might notice here that on the Splendid, the wider part of the key is toward the back of the key, whereas on the Princess, they're just the opposite, and the Princess key tops are a little more rounded, and they're more like the tip of your finger would nestle in there a little bit better, where these are a little flatter. Having said that, though, they're both quite comfortable, but I do think the key tops on the Princess do nestle your fingertips a little bit nicer. Okay, there is another uh, attribute of keyboards that is important to me. It may not be to you, but the spacing between the A key and the shift lock. The uh, Splendid has definitely a wider spacing. The Princess, it's about 7 millimeters between the A key and the shift lock, and on the Splendid, it's about a full centimeter, 10 millimeters between there. So there's definitely less of a problem of me hitting the shift lock with my pinky finger on the Splendid. Both of these machines, of course, are carriage shifted, and I will say that the Princess definitely feels heavier. The Splendid has a lighter feel to it. Its carriage probably weighs less. Just looking at it, the carriage looks less massive on the Splendid compared to the Princess. Okay, let's pop off the ribbon covers on both machines. So on the Olympia, on the Splendid, you pull it off from the rear opening, and it has two little protrusions that fit into the grommets here, and these grommets have been replaced recently. On the Princess, you have to pull up on the two sides near the front of the ribbon cover and then slide it back slightly and you have these two rectangular openings that engage these little bent pieces of metal right here. So there are the two ribbon covers opened up. The tight bar support on the Olympia is a thin piece of gray rubber fit into this bracket here, whereas on the Princess, it's a rubber sleeve or rubber tube that's fit around a metal bracket. Yeah, the Splendid 33 uses eyelets for ribbon reversing and the Princess does not use eyelets for ribbon reversing. Now I was interested in how far down the keystrokes are on both of these machines and it looks like with the exemplar it is about 13.3 millimeters of keystroke. The Olympia is about 13.3 also so they seem to have almost the same depth of keystroke. So I wanted to give you a sense of what the keys feel like and it's not really easy to do this in any objective way without a force gauge and being able to measure the force through the entire keystroke which I don't really have that set up yet but just subjectively the early part of the keystroke there's a place in the keystroke like in this case here where it'll feel like you're pressing the key up to a limit and then you have to go a lot harder to make it go any further. Splendid, you kind of feel that point hitting sooner. So the tight bar here is not quite as far forward when you hit that point, whereas on the Olympia it's a lot closer to the platen. And keeping in mind that I do have a touch adjustment here, but even on the hardest adjustment, the Princess feels lighter. It feels like it has a lighter keystroke slightly, and it feels pretty linear up to this point. That is, the amount of tension you're feeling early on in the keystroke here is about the same as it is later on when you, when you get to this harder point. As I make a faster keystroke, the Splendid definitely feels like it has a harder, slightly more solid, firmer feedback. Like, it requires a little bit more force to go from this point to the final print position. Whereas on the Princess, you hit that harder point earlier, but it feels like it's a little softer through the rest of the stroke. So the keystroke on the Splendid feels firmer throughout its entire keystroke. And when it does get to that harder point, it, it gets noticeably harder the, the very end of the keystroke. There's a sudden increase in back force that you're feeling. It's feeling like it's coming up against a barrier, if you will. Whereas on the Princess, the first two-thirds of the keystroke feels slightly lighter than on the Splendid. And when it does get to that harder point, it's a little softer. It's not quite as sudden and abrupt. So it's a little bit kind of more of a smooth transition in the keystroke 
on the Princess compared to the Splendid. Well, all this talking is really not going to tell us much, as much as what it feels like to actually type on it. So here we are. This Olympia is surprisingly smooth. Considering all the things that I said about it compared to the Princess when you're slowly pushing the type bars, but when you're actually typing on it at speed, it is very smooth. I'm impressed with it. I have no problems touch typing and interfering with it. So I've always loved the Splendid 33 as one of my favorite ultra portable typewriters for this reason. Maybe it's just this particular machine, but it feels so good. On paper, this would be the better machine if you look at specifications alone, since it is more equivalent to the higher end Splendid lineup. Now I do have the touch selector set to the highest setting, and to me it happens to feel a little bit too hard for my comfort. It's a little trickier getting the ribbon cover back on compared to the Olympia. So the touch on this machine, this is kind of an oxymoron. I was doing the touch comparison as you're pushing slowly. It felt like the Princess has a lighter touch, but as I'm actually typing at speed, it feels harder, which is kind of contradictory to what it felt like when you're doing it slow. And also, I am very conscious of how close I am on the A key to the shift lock. So it gives me pause whenever I'm typing the letter A to just be a little more careful. I kind of slow down, it kind of slows me down. That being said, it is a very nice feeling typewriter. It is interesting how it just seems to type a little heavier, even though slow testing it compared to the Olympia, it may feel a little lighter. But anyways, these are all subjective experiences. You have to try it out yourself. Well, okay, so both of these machines are actually quite comfortable to type on for a portable typewriter. I think, though, if I have to compare both of them, which I have to here, that's what the purpose of this video is. If I'm comparing both of these machines, I think as far as the touch, I do have to give the edge to the Olympia. It just feels a little bit smoother, a little bit easier. And of course, the clearance on the A key helps also with me. Having said that though, this uh, Exemplar 300 has more features. You would have to have, like I say, the Splendid 66 to make it a, a fairer test. But I have to give the touch to the Splendid as far as the feel of it. But this isn't bad. I've typed on a lot worse Ultra Portables. Now there is another usability difference with these machines I noticed. So on the Princess, I noticed that the alignment of the clear plastic card guide, specifically the red typing line indicator, is just perfectly lined up with the actual printing line. You can see that red indicator is right at the very bottom of the lowercase letters and it is the marks are pretty well perfectly centered on the letters themselves. This is kind of important when you are removing a piece of paper and having to put it back in the machine and realigning it. The alignment between the actual typing line and your card guide indicator needs to really be close in order to be able to accurately put the paper back in the machine. On the other hand, the card guide on the Splendid 33, you can see the top edge of it is not perfectly lined to the bottom of the printing line. There's a little bit of space there. And this comes down to some slight adjustments that you have to make to the mounting screws for both of these halves of the card guide. And so it's not intrinsic to the model. It's just that with these two particular machines, the card guide is much better aligned on the Exemplar 300 than it is on this particular Splendid 33. And by the way, if you're interested in where those adjustments are, underneath the ribbon right here on both sides are these two little sets of screws. Well, both of these typewriters being so-called ultra portables or lightweight portables or compact portables are really well suited to 
traveling around and typing out away from home. So a good question would be, which one would I bring? Well, that's interesting. Well, as we saw earlier, the Olympia is a little lighter in weight. The Princess, however, has more features. Because of also the Olympia is not only lighter in weight and also is a little smaller, I tend to keep it in one of these shoulder bags. And it makes it convenient because then you have a lot more room for other accessories like paper or whatnot. However, on the other side of the coin, the case that fits on to the Princess has its own storage compartment for paper, as much paper as you could reasonably use in a single session of typing out and about away from the house. You know, it's hard for me to pick one or the other. They're both well suited. The differences are very subtle. I think I would be taking this with a shoulder bag just to be able to carry paper. I think for really brief typing sessions where I don't have to walk too far away from my car, I'd probably take the Princess. Just a nice little compact leather case. Everything you need is inside of it. But you know what? Either of these machines would suit you very well for on-the-go writing. And none of the ultra portables, of course, are going to be as well suited for long term writing as one of the better medium sized portables or more ideally a full size standard typewriter is going to be your best bet for long term writing. Well, I hope this gave you guys a good idea for which of these machines you might be interested in looking for should you see it out on the used market somewhere. But as always, it's best to be able to test it out in person because everybody is unique in the terms of what they prefer for touch, keyboard size, feature set, etc. So if you have, in your general area, if you have a typewriter repair shop that sells reconditioned typewriters, maybe go check one of those out and see if they have something like this. But either one of these models I think would be really great for a portable typewriter, for doing good writing work out in the field. Really my overall goal here or aim here on this channel is to enable your creativity for writing and creating with typewriters. And as always, stay creative and have yourselves a great day. Bye bye for now.